session as planned. And in the afternoon, we'll continue oh, with that, yesterday's that, that afternoon session as planned at 2 o'clock. It was planned. So today, the uh, second segment that's session that's is on avian ecology. It will be chaired by Dr. Suresh Kumar, scientist F, and Dr. Sudhita Dutta, scientist D. The session facilitator is Britain, uh, who will be assisting them with the questions. So I now I hand it over to Dr. Suresh. Uh, Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Vishnu. Uh, at the outset, I'd first like to thank uh, Dr. Dattati and the organizing uh, committee of the Internal Annual Research Seminar for giving me an opportunity to chair the session. And uh, so with the kind permission of the uh, seminar chair, uh, we'll start with the uh, session. So I was told that uh, in all, there were about 60 uh, presentations that I slotted over the last uh, two days and uh, today, so three days. And we have a very small uh, even, uh, ecology uh, session. So there are about three presenters. I'm very happy that we are doing this. So uh, with that, uh, we will invite the uh, first presenter for the day today. And uh, that is uh, Ms. Manishri uh, Good morning. Uh, Ms. Malushri is working as a PhD scholar in WRI and she has brought interest in migratory biology, radio telemetry studies and impacts of threats on bird habitats. Uh, she has previously worked in telemetry of great hornbills from Arnachal Pradesh, impact of wind turbines on birds, the conservation of great Indian busters and black nectarines from uh, Arnachal Pradesh. And she has been working with uh, Wildlife Nature of India since the 2017. And now, um, Malishri will talk about Oparo, the vultures. The floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Malishri, and I will be talking here about vultures today. So, vultures are nature's source of carcass disposal. Carcass are dead animals or cows that they can decompose over a very fast time. Healthy vultures, healthy ecosystem, and healthy people. So vultures has an acidic stomach, and due to their acidic stomach, they can clean up a carcass very fast, other than dogs, which can take up to few days. And the dogs can go to the villages and create diseases like tuberculosis, anthrax, or rabies. They can clear up a carcass in hours, a group of vultures. So there are 23 vultures found in the world, and among them, half almost are in danger of extinction. Nine vultures are found in India, and among them, four are critically endangered. The four critically endangered vultures are white trump slender billed Indian vulture, and red-headed vultures. Before the 1980s, or the 1980s, there were millions of vultures found in India. This is from Timapur, Delhi, a photo taken by Gautam Narayan, where huge number of vultures were found. But after a uh, use of a veterinary drug, nitrophenol, the vultures all died in a very short duration of time. In order to recover the vulture population, captive bred vulture population was created and Jagayu breeding center was created by BNHS. Along with that, another concept also came upon, that is the safe vulture zone concept where a 100 kilometer radius area will be denoted as safe for vultures, where no diclofenac prevalence will be there. Along to that, Nepal has registered the world's first vulture safe zone, and they have the first who have released all their captive bred vulture population in wild. Taking into this, our aim is to understand the wild vulture population and monitor through tagging and monitoring them in wild, and also to understand the safe vulture areas where the vulture can freely roam around. Taking into that, my topic is tracking a globally threatened scavenger, and my uh, supervisor is Dr. Gautam and co-supervisor Dr. Suresh. So white tongue vultures are a large size birds, and they egg single, single lay egg in one season. They are a critical endangered bird, and their population is declining. According to the State of India's Bird Report 2023, the population is still on the rapid decline. My study area lies in northern part of Himachal Pradesh, 
in the Kamra district. It's a 5739 square kilometer area and the elevation ranges from 400 meters to 5000 meters elevation. The beautiful Dhaulagar ranges in backdrop and the tea pine forest where the vultures bleed. The methodology first involved capturing the bird. The capturing was done first following the permission from the forest department and ministry, following new straps and then tagging the birds from the natural carcass disposal sites. We have taken one hour interval data of the bird with a 55 gram EOPS GPS GSM tag. The data was collected from September 21 to August 23. First, the noose straps were set. These noose straps are traditional noose carpets were set along the carcass and then the vulture was captured from the wild. The vulture was taken measurements and then it was really released in the wild and this whole process took 15 minutes to complete. The process also involved tag vulture monitoring that involved two breeding seasons from November 21 to February 23 and it covered almost 864 kilometers by walk and 740 hours or more than 740 hours by walk to understand the vultures distribution in the district. The nest searches and the feeding station searches were an important part of this monitoring process and it also involved question and surveys with locals. The home range of the bird was calculated using MoveApps platform and 95% autocorrelated condensate estimation was informed using fitted continuous time movement model. Our results shown that the vultures are moving from the Pongdam protected area or from the Kamra district to Kashmir towards uh, Pinjur in where the capital grade vulture center is there and also towards the border of Pakistan. They are coming and going back from these areas and our maximum distance traveled was 124 kilometers. Another concept also evolved that the vultures go every day in the morning to their feeding sites and they come back to the nesting sites in the evening. This is a daily routine that has been come up. So the total distance moved by the five species of vultures are this. There are two, two non-breeding vultures and three breeding vultures. These breeding vultures are understood because we have found them breeding two consecutive sites in two breeding seasons. And two non-breeding vultures are uh, going this far, but among them, these two non-breeding vultures, uh, the tags were connecting, sometimes not connecting properly, so the vultures were a bit low. But the non-breeding vultures were going very far in the non-breeding seasons. But the South Adult Vulture, the South Adult Vulture never stayed at one place. It was moving and going from one place to another. At a single day, it was moving 120 kilometers and it was not staying at one place in a day. It was exploring and moving. So our 95% kernel density home range shows that this home range is overlapping with the nest sites as well as the feeding sites that we have covered from our monitoring studies. This home range also has identified 18 breeding sites and 38 feeding stations from the area. The nesting in Kamra happens in chi pine forest and they breed from October to April. Their incubation period is 48 days and they lay one eggs per year. There were also the importance of natural feeding stations at Kamra. These are the areas which are donated by locals who take the carcass from the local areas and dispose of the skin and bone to the area. They use the skin and bone to the industry and the carcass was eaten by the vultures. The vultures actually wait for this car to come and when the car goes, there is another menace by the dogs. The dogs first come and then the time for vultures come. So there is a decrease of these open carcass disposal areas and the practices in Kangra district all, all over Himachal. There is an increase of ground burial practices and there is a decrease in canning industry as well as bone chemical fertilizer industry. For the questionnaire surveys with the panchayat pradhans and officials, it understood that previously in Kangra district there were a huge number of open carcass disposal areas. But with the time, by 2023, there is only 36 number of carcass disposal as per our surveys. There were other threats also like the power line mortalities and the raising and forest fire. The raising and forest fire threats 
are actually demanding to the nesting trees of the vultures. As part of encountered power and mortality from the two-year survey, we have found that 2022 has a high survey because 2023 survey are still ongoing and 2021 survey has started from half of the year, from February. So the number is still on the decline. It's almost more than 14, 15 vultures per year. That is a huge concern. Other than that, there are fire affected nest sites and among them, almost all are affected by fire and raising and Dhina is the most top among them where the vultures have a high number of nests nest and that have higher nest sites. So coming to that, do they know the borders? We don't know. Our two of our vultures have gone to the borders and come, came back from the borders of the Pakistan. This is Radia in uh, Punjab and Borichak in Pakistan, where they're going and coming back, but they're not crossing the border. The border is only 100 meters in part from that part, particular area where they're not crossing. So uh, going to the way forward, no NSIDs have been reported from our study report. We have also sent two of our carcass uh, vulture specimens, dead vulture specimens to BMHs where no NSIDs have been reported. As far as this can be actually a potential vulture safe zone where the vulture reintroduction can be done. Pinjur is 179 kilometers away from the carcass, uh, from the pond uh, area where the vulture can safely roam around. And this can be denoted as a safe zone from Himachal Pradesh. Also along with that, I would like to important, give the importance of the feeding stations which are decreasing. Forest departments along with ministry can denote some areas where the open carcass disposal practices can be denoted in the forest lands, not in outside, so the number will not decrease. With this, I would like to thank all of my team and firstly the Minister of Environment Forest for funding my project and to all of my team without whom I would never be possible to do this survey. Thank you. I'd like uh, next presenter, Ms. Amarjit Kaur. Ms. Amarjit completed graduation and post-graduation from Delhi. Uh, she joined Wildlife Institute of India after that, where she first worked on the Amur Falcons in uh, Nagaland, Manipur. She um, joined her PhD on a long-distance migrant the bird which is the barn swallow in the Indian Himalayan region with uh, Dr. Suresh Kumar and she's currently affiliated with DSD funded uh, NMSHC program working on uh, Himalayan birds. Uh, you may please proceed with the presentation. Thank you Rathan for the introduction. A very good morning to all. Today I am here to present a very interesting story on a long distant migrant barn swallow from the Indian Himalayan region. Barn swallow is a common bird, occurs everywhere. And because of its close association with humans, it builds its nest inside human structure, making it a most popular human commensal species across the world. And this possibly this nature, which has persisted for millennia, has led the species to have this global distribution. The only swallow species to have global distribution like this, where the bird breed in the northern latitudes and migrate down to the southern latitudes to winter. This distribution has led the bird to evolve into six different morpho morphometric, morphologically and genetically distinct subspecies. These subspecies vary in their breeding range as well as in their wintering range, and they follow different migratory routes. Of these six subspecies, four are strictly migrant, while two are only resident subspecies. In the Himalayan region, the 2,500 kilometer long axis where we see different climatic gradients. We come from west to east, we have different precipitation zones and high elevation of Himalaya, narrow valleys, possibly restrict numerous species leading into speciation events. And barn swallow, it occurs everywhere in the Himalayan range. The only information from Ale and Ripley suggests that the nominate subspecies Rustica, which has breeding range in the Russian uh, region, breeds till the central Himalayan region, while the Asian subspecies Gutteralis starts its breeding from the central Himalayan region up till Bhutan 
and possibly in the Brahmaputra Valley some surface. They also say there is a possibility of a contact zone where these two subspecies interbreed. However, there is no any ecological study which is there to confirm this. We do not know where these distribution limits extend. We do not know where these subspecies actually meet or are there different subspecies in the region. For this, we explored the Himalayan axis. We sampled in Kashmir, followed by Uttarakhand and North Bengal, and then in Imphal Valley, Manipur. These sites vary in their climatic zones and also dif having different latitudes. We see in Srinagar, birds are breeding in higher latitudes, but at limited elevation zone, possibly till 1600 meters. While in Uttarakhand and North Bengal, in the middle latitudes, they are ranging up to 2200 meters of elevation. One interesting population that we have is in Manipur, where these birds are not migratory. While the rest of the birds come to the Himalaya only in the summertime to breed, the Manipur birds stay throughout the year. They do not migrate at all. So these itself is indicative of how different these populations could be. So we started with capturing these unsolos across these sites and took a list of morphometric measurements. And from this, a total of 200 uh, barn solos were captured, of which 158 adults were uh, analyzed for this study. First, just to visualize how these populations, in terms of their morphometric traits, are distinct in space, we carried out PCA. Further, we used wing length as a trait of body size to identify whether there are different populations in these ranges. And then we use these uh, wing length again as a character to see whether there is any latitudinal trend in this body size. And there is a sexual dimorphic trait in one swallow that is the tail streamers or outermost tail feather. And we analyze this for males and females separately for all these three regions. Interestingly, when we come to the phenotype or when we look at these birds and we held them in our hands, it was imperative that these birds are different from Kashmir to the Himalayan region, which is the Uttarakhand and North Bengal, and then we have Manipur birds. They dis uh, distinct themselves with breast band extent, belly color, and ventral color. And these characters did not fall with the original norms of these subspecies that is known from the other regions or other countries. So what are these? The initial PC analysis showed that the using the two PC axes, which explain about 58% of the variation, that PC1, representing the body size, show that the birds from Srinagar are larger in their body size, while the birds of Manipur are smaller in body size, whereas the Himalayan birds are falling in the middle. When we analyzed for wing length variation, it was found that the birds of Kashmir are indeed bigger in body size. They had longer wing lengths than compared uh, with Himalaya or Manipur. And this distinction is also confirmed with the audit studies with barn swallows captured in Russia and China, where it possibly says that the Srinagar Valley birds correspond to the rustica subspecies. And when we check this trend for the latitude, again it showed that the higher the latitude, the birds were larger in body size. However, if we do more sampling across this latitude, we will get a better trend on this variation. And the tail streamers, as expected, males having the larger tail streamers uh, across these sites differ from females in having large tail streamers. And when we compare this for the males, again it was found that the Kashmir birds had larger tail streamers than Manipur, then in Himalaya. So oh, again these birds corresponded to the uh, study which are there uh, for the Rustica, also for the Rustica deuteralis subspecies. Still, it is not yet clear where these birds are falling in their subspecies variations. So, when we look at these features, we see that Kashmir birds are indeed larger in size. They have longer wing lengths, they, they have longer tail streamers. But why exactly? We see these birds are limited to their western limits. We see there is Peer Panjal range in Kashmir, possibly restricting these birds in that westernmost part of the range. And therefore, the birds from Himachal onwards have continuous breeding distribution. 
and this peep and child range is possibly dictating why these birds are different from rest of the Himalayan axis and also from the Impa. Another interesting story is of the wing length. We saw that Kashmir birds had larger wing lengths, uh, Manipur birds had smallest wing length, which again corresponds with how much they are moving, the migratory distance. Kashmir birds, along with the Rustica subspecies of the European range, could possibly be following the same migratory route of the Rustica subspecies, that is, breeding in the Himalaya, then moving down to the southern Africa, possibly taking the longest um, migratory route than rest of the Himalayan subspecies. While the Gutteralis is moving to the southern parts of India, limiting its wing length. And we have the Manipur population which do not need to move, and therefore they have the smallest of all, the smallest wing length of all the birds. This study affirms the general rule as we move up to the latitude, the modification of Bergsman rule or the James rule, which states that within species we see this variation. When we capture individuals across latitudes, the higher the latitude, the larger the body size. And very likely, these morphological traits, we saw that they are of, they have distinct morphology, but again, are these falling into those intergrades? Are there Drastica Gutteralis intergrades in the Himalaya? So this, this still is not very clear. So the color, current ongoing study on the molecular approach will better cl clarify on this, what are these populations, what are these subpopulations, and whether there are contact zones in the region or not. With this, I would like to acknowledge all these people for their immense support. Without them, the study would not have been completed. And my heartfelt thanks to all the people from Kashmir, Uttarakhand, Bengal, and Manipur who let us venture into their properties in the night, capture their swallows, and uh, study our own research. And with this, I thank you all. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to invite the last presenter for the session, Ms. Renu Bala. Uh, Ms. Renu did her master's in zoology from Kurukshetra University. Uh, she had registered for her PhD in March 2020 and is also working as a project associate in the Uttarakhand House of Arrow project from, 2020, uh, from April 2021. <coughs> and she'll be giving her talk on the House of Arrow. Thank you for the introduction. So today I will be uh, discussing about morphological adaptations in the House of Arrow along an elevational gradient in the Himalayas. So first we explore some of the most challenging environments of this earth and some of the bird, uh, birds that are adapting to these harsh conditions. So from uh, ice expanses of the Arctic to the uh, scorching hot deserts, or from the open oceans to the higher reaches of mountains, birds have adapted and thrived where few other could. Uh, such as emperor penguins in the Antarctica with their thick layer of insulation or albatrosses in the open oceans with their enormous wingspan gliding for hours and hours or even days without flipping their wings. These are some of the adaptations with which they are surviving in these harsh environments. So after uh, having this brief introduction on bird adaptation, let's move to the higher altitude, where birds have to uh, face a series of challenges, uh, uh, such as uh, uh, low temperatures or low oxygen levels and uh, equal, uh, unique ecological niches. So to overcome these hurdles, they have to, uh, they have to evolve uh, some remarkable strategies. So some of these strategies are, uh, one of the key adaptation that uh, they go, uh, go through is the larger body size because uh, la having larger body size means uh, uh, lower body surface to volume ratio which, ha which helps in retaining heat more effectively in the colder environments and then using their plumage as an insulating layer. So uh, they can do this either by having uh, larger uh, feathers that uh, uh, overlap more to create a deeper plumage or they can have larger pro proportion of the plumulation section of their feathers. Uh, this plumulation section, it helps in uh, uh, trapping uh, insulative uh, pocket of air close to the body. 
So it, it helps in the insulation in those uh, colder climates. And then like uh, birds are also expert in regulating their uh, metabolic rates because it is vital to survive in the low uh, oxygen conditions. And they, they, there are some uh, birds such as the uh, alpine lake center, they, they can store food in the rocks um, uh, for, for these harsh conditions. And the last one is the altitudinal migration and so where some of these birds they migrate down in the winter months and uh, then go back to, uh, in the breeding season. So after uh, having the, these, uh, after building this uh, understanding on uh, our uh, bird adaptation in the higher uh, mountain, <coughs> let's move our, uh, our focus to the house sparrows in the Himalayas. So why house sparrows? Uh, house sparrows are known for their broad uh, distribution and range. They, they are uh, found everywhere with humans. And this broad uh, distribution range, it, it, it uh, offers a strong system to study how these changes, they can arise within a single species. Uh, even on a small uh, spatial scale. So uh, there are two subspecies found in the Indian region. Uh, one is Crescent domesticus uh, indicus that is common throughout India and the other one is the Crescent domesticus parthenic which is found in the trans Himalayan region. So it is, uh, within Uttarakhand uh, Himalaya, which, uh, uh, which is the species and what is the distribution of these two subspecies, it is not clear. And how these population differences are there and how these uh, species, it is surviving in those higher elevations of Himalaya because we know that they are expanding their range as uh, the, uh, the development is going on in the Himalayas. So to, uh, to look for this, uh, we studied that whether body size and feather structure, it varied with elevation among house parents along a single elevation of gradient starting from 300 meters to all the way up to 3,500 meter. Uh, so we uh, we predicted that uh, based on uh, these uh, ecophysiological rules, we predicted that house sparrows they will uh, be uh, larger in size at higher elevation and will have shorter extremities and will have more insulative feather structure to cope in the low uh, temperature environment. So uh, for this, we selected 13 sites at a different elevations uh, uh, from three, uh, 300 meter to 3500 meter along this uh, single elevation gradient in the Garhwal region of Uttarakhand. <laughs> so uh, for, uh, we uh, sampled uh, 169 sparrows uh, by using mist netting and then we weighed and uh, banded these uh, birds with metal ring and measured these morphometric variables. So for the feather structure, we collected Two uh, contour feathers, each from the uh, uh, two from each of the dorsal side and the ventral side uh, uh, of uh, every bird, and uh, then we photograph this bird, uh, photograph these feathers, and uh, uh, then uh, this length of the dummy. This section is important because this uh, part of uh, dummy, like this uh, pinnaceous section, it is the proximal section of the feather which helps in insulation. So we, we measure these uh, lengths using image software. For each uh, uh, image separately, uh, we uh, we converted the distance in pixel into uh, <coughs> centimeters using this reference scale. So uh, for statistical analysis, we, we first tested the relationship of these uh, morphometric variables with uh, uh, elevation uh, using linear mixed model with sex as a random effect and elevation as a fixed effect. And then we also tested whether this proportion of down and the relative feather length, uh, it also changed with elevation using same uh, linear mixed models. So our result, they showed that uh, all these morphometric traits, which are the parameters for body size, they differed with elevation and they show, uh, showed a significant increase with elevation, as you can see from the p-value. Uh, uh, from these uh, graphs also, it is uh, visible that there is a clear increase uh, in the body size parameters and also in the beak shape. Beak shape uh, is uh, uh, the beak length divided by the beak height. So it, it, it is a measure of beak shape and uh, at higher elevation, it was, it was seen that uh, birds are having uh, longer and shallower beaks as compared to the birds at uh, lower elevations. <laughs> so in the, uh, to, uh, in the feather structure analysis, it was seen that in case of uh, dorsal side feather, feathers, uh, proportion
proportion of down it increased with uh, elevation, but we did, we did not see this trend in case of ventral side feathers. So it, it means that uh, the uh, feathers at the back uh, they are they are evolving more with uh, with these uh, uh, harsh conditions in the high elevations. So uh, uh, what we can really interpret from these results? So uh, uh, our research they, they have uh, our research has shown that there is a climate increase in the body size across elevations and uh, we, we can say that these modifications can arise uh, within a small spatial scale. And uh, there are other studies with, uh, where they have studied this effect, this trend uh, across latitudes. But uh, this study is the first study to uh, uh, first study to see whether these changes they can occur across elevations. So and uh, the sparrows uh, regarding the beak shape, uh, having longer, shallower beak, it means that uh, there are likely uh, diets uh, it likely to change with elevations and. It is yet another axis that uh, sparrows are adopting uh, in the uh, Himalayan environments. And uh, uh, for feather structure, uh, we, uh, we, we have seen that they are showing the increasing uh, proportion of downy back feather. It is also suggesting that they are adapting to this low uh, temperature, having more insulative feather structure as compared to the low elevation uh, sparrows. And it, it is consistent with other findings in other uh, taxa. And uh, so uh, we can say that back feathers, they, they are, which are exposed to the more uh, uh, environmental pressure, they are, uh, they are selected, uh, they are naturally selected uh, more to have more insulative feather structure in colder environments. So what we can include, that, uh, this is, this is uh, uh, one example that how birds can adapt uh, uh, to, to adjust in blue changing environments and along this uh, single elevation gradient. And uh, it, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, possible to observe uh, strong climate variations in body size and feather structure. And uh, these strategies are especially helpful for the white uh, this species. It is, uh, it is such widely occurring species so, uh, to exist to, and to coexist in humans. So it is helpful in expanding its range to the higher reaches of the Himalayas. So I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, these people so, for helping in this uh, study. And with this, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. So with this, uh, we will come to the uh, presentations, the end of the presentations. And uh, I will now request my uh, co-chair, Dr. Sutrita. Uh, we do have a lot of questions, I think. So he's going to put up the questions now. While we fix this technical glitch, we can we can uh, start taking the questions. We'll first take questions for uh, Madhushri. Uh, the first question is from uh, Shudhi, who congratulates you on the work and asks how is fire-related vulture death detected, and whether there is any measure of year-wise for fire-related vulture deaths. Uh, is fire-related? Uh, can you repeat the question? Asks how do you have detected the fire related vulture deaths and whether there is any quantification of that. Okay, so I have not detected fire related vulture deaths. It's the fire related nest sites. The nesting trees are being affected, and by year by year, how the nesting trees are falling down by fire. The GBA size has been reduced. So that is another study that I have not shown here, but the GBA has been reduced by fire day by day or year by year. The next question is by Kamar sir. Uh, he also congratulates you and asks, do you have data uh, about change in carcass disposal? Uh, and this change countrywide, especially in North, will have a huge impact on carnivore communities. 
Yes, absolutely. Actually, this data has been come up from panchayats as well as patiaris. They are called as the landholders. So they have given us data of the districts as well as the panchayat pradhans. But if we see the whole northern India data, this can be make a huge impact on how the virtual numbers decrease. We'll try to take only uh, three questions for each uh, speaker. The last question for you is from Rohija, fantastic study, must be replicated countrywide. And he asks, what factors are driving an increase in ground burial practices? Is it religious or is it a response by local administrations to manage increasing free-ranging dog populations? So the increase in ground burial practices has been related to many factors. The first factor is that the number of uh, management areas like the panchayat pradhans don't uh, have areas donated denoted for the uh, disposal of the carcass that i told that forest land should be denoted for more carcass disposal the lands are nearby villages and village people uh, create uh, nuisance that these smells are going to their household so this is the first concern and the second concern is these dogs the dogs are also increasing day by day and it is spreading diseases to the nearby villages so village owners will not give any areas for open carcass disposal and the ground burial is increasing thank you thanks Shri. i will request you to wait uh, if we have time we can take some more questions <coughs> Uh, a question for you from Dr. Vishnupriya. What role do you think phenotypic plasticity has to play in the inferences you have made regarding morphological variations or founder effects, since, uh, since it seems to be a continuum when the range is taken? Oh, thank you, ma'am, for the questions. Very interesting question, actually. So we see that birds, uh, barn swallows, across their range are already in inter they are interbreeding and there are variations that are mixing up. But in the Himalaya, it's the southernmost limit of the breeding. So Rustica subspecies across the Europe, and then it comes to the Himalaya. Again, the Gibraltaris, which is which is in the Asian subspecies, again has the southern limit in the Himalayan zone. So there are possibilities that these populations are different, and they are possibly interbreeding with each other. So. The next question for you is from Dr. Abhiji, who. Uh, Say, so multiple subspecies are already known in barn swallows, variations are expected. Do you validate these as subspecies or believe they could be distinct, uh, sub, uh, distinct species? And he suggests uh, using museum uh, for further research. Thank you, sir, for the question. So uh, for this point, I'm not saying that they are different species. There could be possibly different subspecies as uh, for, from our morphological data. and. Uh, Museum. So yes, regarding that museum study, we are already exploring the museum museum specimens that are available. And sadly, there are not enough specimens from the breeding grounds. We have specimens from elsewhere in the India, opportunistic samples. So we are going to examine those samples as well. The third question for you is uh, from Kamasar. Uh, congratulates you and asks, do you think tail structure variation is due to wind condition in these areas? And also suggests to use uh, discriminant function analysis instead of principal component okay. analysis. Okay, thank you sir for the suggestion. So the tail streamer variation is uh, not really due to the wind, uh, wind variations across this region because uh, birds, uh, they, this tail streamer is actually a sexually selected trait. So the, and it differs across subspecies. So Rustica is known to uh, select more uh, larger tail streamer birds than the Deuteralis. So that's why these variations we observe, but not really because of the wind uh, related effect. Because these birds are highly uh, aerial insectivores, what affects is the wing, wings of these birds for the aerial uh, flights. Rohit has two questions for you. I'll take the first one. He asked, uh, higher latitude areas exist in Southern Hemisphere too, 
but pond swallows do not seem to breed. What do you think will be the factors influencing that? Limited land area or other constraints? Uh, so, barn swallows are known only to breed in the northern latitudes with the, uh, in summer time. And they winter in the southern latitudes uh, when the extreme conditions happen in the northern latitudes. It's again a response to the insect availability across the hemisphere. And it's a seasonal variation in these insects that actually dictates the uh, swallows to breed in the northern latitudes and come down to the southern latitudes to winter. What is the next question? Is there anything else? Uh, what's the next? Uh, sorry, I, I think, I'm not able to. Yeah, I think uh, Rohit has made a comment that we can be a visual guru in furthering <laughs> human wildlife bonds. What insights you gain from human communities living with bond swallow? That's a very nice question. So I would like to emphasize that as we see, there are lots of human conflict, human conflict. Uh, studies from India because uh, large population, low land for less uh, animal species. But here we see a very beautiful story of barn swallows living close to humans. And if we go in the mountains, you will see that people actually wait for these birds to come back to their properties and nest. So they actually consider them very auspicious for them. And they also believe that these birds bring good, uh, good fortune to them. And in every part of the range, wherever I survey, people had different stories to tell, which is another one huge topic to talk about. So I'd be glad if somebody will talk about that as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Amarjit. We'll take the next speaker, Ms. Reni. First uh, question is from Kamasar who uh, comments that variables views have large variation. You need to be careful in interpretation. Regression through means sometimes will be misleading. Sample size will provide significant difference, uh, larger sample size, and to partial regression with residuals. Uh, thank you for the suggestion, sir. And yeah, there are uh, lots of variables because uh, we say that strictly the birds at lower elevation they are having lo a, 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 a smaller body size because it also depends on other factors also such as uh, age of the bird or condition of the bird so, so uh, they will show such variation i will work on your suggestion sir the next question for you is from uh, dr goel sir who asks, how do you explain high variability in data sets? Some bird measurements at higher altitude have similar data at sim similar measurements at lower yeah, altitude. As I said, it, it, it does depend on other factors also, such as bird condition, how, like, the, how uh, the age of the bird and condition of the bird, like, uh, like how physically fit the bird is. The third question for you is from Dr. Bilal, who says one of the major issues for house sparrow is its recent decline. Do you think your study is going to help uh, in understanding the issues of house sparrow decline? Yeah, uh, for, th for this pro project, we are also uh, working on those as aspect and we are, uh, we are studying the population ecology of house sparrows across all these elevations. So it, it will help uh, us in understanding what are the factors that are uh, determining how sparrow decline, if there are any in this state. I'll do the species, sir. Yeah, uh, it's not really a question. Uh, first, let me congratulate all three of you. Uh, it's nice to see uh, ornithological studies are completely <coughs> overtaken by women in the flying machines, in all three of you. And that too is And also, very, very interesting project. Um, vultures on the way out, almost on the verge of extinction, and your work will probably provide an insight into what the future for the vulture. And the two other studies in which you are uh, talking about, they are almost similar in nature, uh, but two different species. Uh, but uh, yes, the uh, sparrow has uh, already been talked about a great deal, uh, the China leading the great extinction of the sparrows in China. And India is also celebrating a sparrow day, and uh, your study will provide an insight into in what direction the sparrow conservation will go. Uh, 
my question uh, and a suggestion to uh, Mahalakshmi uh, is a wonderful work and uh, your work uh, will probably follow the work which was carried out uh, in Nepal. Yes. Uh, and uh, probably also it will open the uh, future work of the proposed religious of cultures by the DMSS Five Center. Yes. Uh, while I say, Now that this could 
multiply the sides, whether in the forest regions or close to village, you know, kind of common lands. And there, the department should start monitoring the data. So you transfer the technology and uh, what we call the skills and knowledge in terms of monitoring the staff. So I think you can give a very, very good guideline and uh, wonderful presentation. Actually, your slides are wonderful. Not only yours, I think, and all the things. Protected area, there is Kongdam protected area and another in 
all other national park. So there are a lot of areas outside these protected areas where vultures still are there and they are roaming freely. So if we want to save their habitat, if we want to know their actual uh, area, they, then this disposal area becomes extremely important. I know there are a lot of protected areas in Madhya Pradesh and any other areas, but where there are no protected areas, there should be some uh, carcass disposal areas that can help survive the population. And another thing taking to that, Kangra has also this uh, open carcass, because of this higher number of open carcass disposal sites in Kangra, these vulture populations are also high in number that are not seen in any other area. So, my Thank you. Uh, So I, I will I will say that yes, uh, the conservation of the tigers do need to be protected areas and just start the uh, tiger disposal outside protected areas. Uh, there is also this uh, 
you know, with increasing development and urbanization, I would say, people are no longer wanting to have the carcasses dumped uh, in their backyard. So literally, uh, the carcass dumping sites are being pushed away further and further. And in many places, they are just doing burial, which means that we are effectively reducing the food supply to vultures. So it's not about within protected areas, outside protected areas, that alone is the discussion. Vultures have ranged across uh, these landscapes that are protected, not protected. So a much bigger insight that needs to go in. In fact, I would just like to end this off by making this one comment that in Rajasthan, there are few carcass dumping sites. And at one dumping site very close to Jodhpur, I saw that carcasses were being dumped there. But there was one small building there and some smoke coming off from a chimney. I was horrified that every day there are about 35 carcasses that are collected from in and around Jodhpur coming into that area. But they are straight away, they are, they are, they are, the animals are skinned and the entire carcass is put into a grinder and it's all ground up. And you'll be surprised what they're actually doing with that. The pellets that are generated from that is straight away going into the chicken feed. So I won't comment anything beyond that. So you know what is happening with cattle, beef, uh, literally, and that's the way that is processed. So what the vultures are basically getting is the skull and uh, the leg, there, there's hardly anything. So I think vultures are starving for food, you know, in many places. And only in some traditional sites, like somewhere up here in Himachal and all that, the traditional practices of feeding the practices in the open, that the vultures are getting enough to feed. So uh, thank you once again for giving us the opportunity to chair and co-chair this session. And uh, thank you, uh, Bipin, for uh, helping us with putting uh, up these questions. And thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Suresh. I think uh, I, I would like to request all of you standing at the door, please come and take your seats here. There are empty seats in the front. Please come and take your seats. Please don't stand near the door there. And uh, we'll move on to our next session, which is on habitat ecology. The session will be chaired by Dr. B.S. Adhikari, Scientist G, and co-chaired by Dr. Navindu, Scientist D. The session will be facilitated by Dr. Vinit Singh. Ripali has done her graduation in Botany Honours from Delhi University. 
and a master in environmental management from Indo Trust University. Nepali began her research journey at the Wildlife Institute of India as a master dissertation student. Currently, she is working as a junior project fellow in the NMC phase two project in soil biodiversity component. Over to you. Clipping needs to be done and we leave it for at least 24 hours for 
it to get stabilized. However, this step is avoided in case of ecosystem respiration measurements. For my second objective, as per the review, we have divided the regulatory factors into two major parts, that is abiotic and biotic. In abiotic, as I have said, we are monitoring soil temperature and volumetric soil water content, that is the soil moisture. For today's presentation, in biotic parameters, we are going to see the vegetation type rule. Recently, we have done the identification of the plant species which were present in our study site and divided into four major clusters, grasses, sedges, perennial herbs, and annual herbs. And based on the dominating plant community, we have divided our plots into herbaceous meadows, that is the plots dominated by the herb community of the plants, and sedge meadow, that is dominated by the sedges. For this presentation especially, we have used SPSS Statistics 26 and first we did a normality test and found our data was normally distributed, followed by the suitable statistic analysis. The data ahead presented is in the form of mean and standard errors. So we installed open top chambers with the aim of increase in the air temperature and we successfully achieved our first objective we found overall increase of 2.28 degrees Celsius of air temperature for the month of June and July 2023. And this increment maybe had an indirect effect on the soil temperature in herbaceous meadows. However, we found no significant impact on the soil water content for this particular plot. In the case of sedge meadow, the soil temperature followed the similar trends. But interestingly, here, the soil water content was reduced by 32.2%, which highlights the role of vegetation type. As per the review, we found that C4 plants are known to have high absorption capacity, which was further coupled with the impact of increment in temperature, leading to such a significant decline. Talking of ecosystem respiration and experimental warming, we found 53.6% increase, overall increase in sedge meadows. However, this increment was comparatively less for herbaceous meadows. Again, highlighting three major factors. First, the temperature, then the moisture, and then the role of vegetation type, which underlines the importance of studying the biotic as well as abiotic parameters for understanding what exactly is happening in an ecosystem. Interestingly, we found no significant impact of experimental warming on soil respirations, either in of herbaceous or sedge meadows, which may be due to the wide adaptive range of the heterotrophic component of the soil. However, to understand what exactly is happening here, we need to further monitor and know all of the regulatory parameters as far as possible. So far, we have found that the thermal properties of the soil, that is the soil temperature, are majorly influenced by the air temperature. However, hydrological properties of the soil are majorly governed by the vegetation type for this particular study. Also, experimental watering reduced the soil moisture content in sedge meadow and increased the soil temperature for this particular research. And also, experimental warming may elevate above ground respiration, fostering the ecosystem here. In next four years, we are aiming to assess the seasonal variations in these respiration rates and their responses to the experimental warming, along with a better understanding of its regulatory parameters so that we can Interestingly, you know, uh, understand the plant-soil interactions which are taking place, especially in the alpine meadow, our study site. In the last but not the least, I would like to thank each and every of the contributors due to which we are able to perform our research and also to all of you for your time and patience. Thank you. Thank you, Dipali. Uh, the next pre presenter is uh, Mr. Siku Kumar.
the title of his presentation is Distribution Pattern of Invasive Alien Species and Impact of Lantana Camera on Soil and Vegetation in Western Brazil. Siku Kumar is PhD scholar in WIA. His area of interest in plant animal interaction in Himalayan policy ecosystem. Currently, he is working in PhD funded project on invasive ecology in Rajaji Taika River under the supervision of Dr. Anit Kumar. Thank you for the introduction. A very good morning to all of you. The topic of my presentation is distribution pattern of invasive alien plants and impact of Lantana Kumara on soil in Western Rajaji Taika River. As we all know, uh, invasive species are the biggest challenge worldwide. As for the CBD, uh, invasive species are considered to be the second most important threat to biodiversity after habitat destruction. So, uh, while numerous studies have shed light on the subject of uh, like how uh, uh, how the invasive species is affecting the our ecosystem, but still there is some research gap which is uh, limited understanding of ecological impact on flora and fauna, effect on soil physico-chemical properties. As we all aware, Langara Kamara is highly invasive species has become prominent concern within the protected area due to its rapid sp uh, spread and its impact on uh, our native biodiversity. So, uh, lots of previous studies were done in Western Himalaya, but so according to previous studies, uh, we found the major work or focus on the techniques of controlling the spread of Lantana Kamara, like example like cut root stock method and restoration through plantation of native species after Lantana removal. However, uh, effect of Lantana Kamara on native species were like uh, they, this study indicated effect of and second is the effect of lantana kumara on soil chemistry is also uh, poorly understood. Invasion pattern of other exotic species have uh, not been carried out till date. So now coming to our objective for the uh, project, we uh, focus on two objectives. First, in, uh, first is investigate the distribution pattern of invasive alien plants. And second is study the impact of lantana kumara on soil physical chemical properties in Western Brazil. Now coming to the study area, the study area was carried out in the Western Rajaji Tiger Reserve where we uh, focus on the, uh, on the uh, seven ranges of Western Rajaji in which for the experimental plots we focus on four ranges of the Rajaji that is Chiravali, Dhorkan, Peribara, Haridwar. In the methodology part, we uh, uh, for objective one for distribution pattern of invasive species, we uh, done the grid based vegetation sampling and maps and in which we uh, uh, we take a total 180 grid of two by two kilometers. We survey on in that we survey 120 grids and uh, you can see the occurrence records there. For our objective two, that's the uh, impact of Lantana Kamara on soil. We uh, done a recommend survey of in, uh, in all four ranges. In four ranges, we focus mark those areas as invaded who has like uh, more than 50 percent uh, lantana cover and uh, in, uh, more than 50 percent lantana cover in a one hectare area. <coughs> the uh, we, def we define also lantana invaded site. Uh, lantana and invaded site, those which have uh, lantana divided in one hectare. For our objective two, uh, for the soil properties, we done uh, uh, we done a uh, we done a soil sampling in you know, each plot of uh, uh, four corner and the center, and we make the composite and we analyze further analyze in the lab. For the vegetation sampling, we took the total 102 plots in which uh, uh, you can see the representation of our sampling site in which we uh, take quadrant sampling of 10 to 10 meters. Now coming to our result for distribution pattern of, uh, pattern of invasive alien plants in Rajaji, we found that Lantana Kamara has highest density followed by the fast genium, Hazaritum and uh, Senatora. Now coming to the distribution of the lantana kamara, we found that the most of the like the, uh, 
prior part which is followed by the Haridwar, Delipara and Dhalkhand have a uh, hybrid ends with the lantana whereas the Kansau which is in north face have a less lantana cover. Now coming to the Parthenium, we uh, got a very interesting result which is like it's followed the like road uh, network like uh, most of the uh, occurrence is nearby the road of the western Rajaji. Uh, now coming to the Ejeritera at Enopora, we found that uh, they generally prefer the uh, moist area and they, uh, we found the, this species generally along the river streams and moist part of the uh, western Rajaji in which we found that uh, the Kansau has the uh, high, highest density of the uh, Ejeritera at Enopora. Now coming to our objective to impact of lantana from around soil in western Rajaji. Uh, we found that uh, pH and either organic carbon and phosphorus has uh, like significant change with respect to inverted and uninverted. So we found that like uh, there is increase in uh, organic carbon and phosphorus in the inverted site while pH is decreasing in the inverted site. And there is no significant changes we are uh, got in the um, essential nutrients like nitrogen, electric conductivity, potassium and organic matter. Now coming to the density of the invasive alien plants in forest regions of the Rajaji Tiger Reserve, we found that the uh, Lantana Kamara is highest in the Viribara region and followed by Haridwar and Chiravali. Uh, Chiravali. Uh, and for the Parthenium, we found that uh, there is highest density in the Viribara followed by Chiravali and uh, Haridwar. For as a rate we got in the, uh, like mostly density in the Haridwar region followed by Chira Valley. For Senatora, we got in mostly in Haridwar, uh, sorry, mostly in Chira Valley followed by the Haridwar. Now coming to the our summary, here is the like uh, following uh, three most uh, summary we got it from our study. That's the uh, Lantana Kamara, Parthenium, Senatora, as a rate of Metronopora, as a rate and uh, so as a trainer, I don't know, and as a rate of most dominant invasive species in Western Rajasthan, Lantana showed highest density in Dolphin and Beribara, whereas as a rate of was relatively highest in Ramgar and Kansau. And Lantana invaded sites showed significant lower organic carbon and phosphorus, but higher values of soil pH as compared to Lantana and invaded sites. So I would like to acknowledge the following. First question is from Kamar sir. Have you dealt with special autocorrelation and other parameters like aspect? This is first question. Okay. And the second question is, are you planning to do true replicates in alpine meadows, in absence of which the results will have limited extrapolation ability? Yes. So both of the questions are really interesting to answer. The first I'll take to the statistics part. I have mentioned that for just now we have done such tests and yes, I am looking into a time when we have sufficient data to go into autocorrelation also. For now we have not done, done the correlation part because we really want to first see the natural trends which we are getting and it's just the two months data for now and still we are standardizing the methodology. Once it is done, definitely some will go into it. The second is the true replicates. So I have not mentioned it here because very recently we have stepped into it. So this is a south facing slope. We are planning to look for more alpine meadows in south facing, also in north facing. Just to have an idea what exactly, you know, ongoing to see how these vegetation, how the respiration rates are varying, maybe due to the slope, 
or the things which we are just hypothesizing, are they really happening? So yes, we need to answer these questions and we are into a planning phase. East and West also, sir. Yes, all the slopes actually we are looking into, especially Gangotri National Park. It's a challenge to find the similar ecosystem without any human disturbance. So, yes. Thanks, Nipali. We have one more question from Naveen Joshi. It is well known fact that each species respond differently to climate change. Alpine meadows have a wide range of grass species. While selecting a site for OTC, do you consider this fact? Definitely, process? definitely, sir. So answering this question is, uh, very recently we have done plant identification. We also, you know, predicted that the grass species is the dominating species in alpine meadows, but for the meadows of uh, Kangotri National Park, especially into the focus, it is not the case. And not always the grass species are the dominating ones playing roles. Also, we are focusing more on the respiration and then coming to the vegetation type. We are also planning to include the vegetation cover once we are done with what we are doing for now. There's another question. There's another question, Deepali. Yeah. How is this study different from NMSH phase one study and similar OTC studies done by uh, GBPHI and MODA? Even WII has done sir, such similar study in phase one. <coughs> And I am very confident that this study is very different in terms of multiple aspects. First, related to your experimental design. Second, related to the methodology. And third, related to the approach at looking up the nature. The major limitation of our study only in the first phase was we assumed that the reality is simple. You know, one of the experts from Wildlife Institute of India only said me that not always reality is simple, so we need to put our predictions, our assumptions in that line, and we are not going to repeat the same what we did. So yes, it, it was a great learning in phase one, and we are continuing it in a better way. Right, last set of questions for you, yeah. uh, This one's from Praveen. Since climate change is a gradual phenomenon occurring on a long period of time, how do you think your experimental warming study which is an instant change, will help in understanding of impact of climate change. So this is a pilot study whose one of the major aim is for the establishment of long-term monitoring plots for studying such uh, similar phenomena. So this is how the study is contributing to this aspect, definitely. Okay, that's Thank it you. for you. We have two questions. First one is from Ayan. Congratulations for the presentation. Is there any difference in lantana regeneration between invaded and uninvaded sites? That's the first question. You can answer that and I'll give out the other. Uh, actually, we recorded the data in the uninvaded un site and invaded site too for the lantana sapling too, but we didn't uh, analyze yet. We are like to proceed in the uh, uh, like few months. The follow-up question for Maya is, in sites where lantana were artificially removed, do other alien invasive species take over? Uh, yeah, we found that in our study, like Parthenium as a, as a rate of our, like uh, follow, we can say also like, uh, that's a invasive uh, meltdown hypothesis, because wherever like lantana were removed, we found that like uh, it's overtake by the Parthenium and Azeratum. We also uh, uh, done the study, we found uh, like uh, these species, like Senatora is also like very competitive in nature, so yeah, but we didn't put in this one. Thank you. Next question is from Dr. Bilal. This is an interesting question, Sipu. A uh, recent study has evaluated role of mega hub growth on uh, Recent studies have evaluated role of mega herbivores on invasion, especially on lantana. 
Considering higher number of elephants in Rajaji, what is your opinion about elephant numbers and lantana presence? Uh, actually, I didn't think about uh, on that actually, but uh, basically, which I encounter uh, during my field study, which I found, like they generally uh, prefer either like where is the plantation of the Malacca's Philippensis or maybe the, like some suitable like edible for them and the grasses like sacrum and these all. So these areas like if I am talking about the Malacca's Philippensis, this is the associated species of the soya robusta. The so uh, and soya robusta is in gold in, uh, like uh, cover. So there are few lantana will, you will get it uh, from uh, where is the soya robusta is uh, uh, found. And because of the, uh, we also like done the study with the canopy cover where we found that canopy cover is inversely proportional to uh, like uh, 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 lantana. So uh, in this respect, we, uh, we generally found that most of the elephant prefer either open habitat or maybe uh, like uh, for like uh, 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 open habitat or maybe the, for like feeding habitat they generally prefer uh, like manutus areas and the grass patches and they have uh, like some more trees which they prefer like uh, uh, there are some more trees like they prefer in especially like uh, uh, sorry I forgot the name actually but uh, generally prefer the most like open area and for the fitting actually. So this is all. Uh, thank you uh, Siku and uh, uh, Bali. Uh, I think Dr. Sajimar want to say something. Thanks uh, Dr. Adhikari. Uh, I just wanted to uh, give some information here. The open top chamber studies uh, is one of the best ways of looking at the impacts of climate change on alpine vegetation. These studies have started in North America and Europe 30, 40 years ago. And they have data for about uh, three, four decades. In the Himalaya, we began only about 10 years ago. WII, GB Fund, even institutions in uh, Bangalore have got uh, OTC setups in the Indian Himalayan region. So we have some setup in Gangotri. Uh, other institutions are working in other parts of Gangotri as well as in other parts of Uttarakhand, North Sikkim, and now we, uh, under the NMC project, have also set up OTCs in Arunachal Pradesh, that is in Sela Park area. So the idea is if all the institutions are going to set up OTCs and the methodologies are going to be the same, and if we have some kind of a formal or an informal understanding of how we are going to do this, then after 10, 20 years, we will have a very good data set of understanding how climate change is impacting uh, alpine middle regions in using open top uh, chamber studies in the entire Himalayan region as you move from east to the west. This is what I wanted to add. I just pass it on back. Uh, thank you, Dr. Satyakumar. Now I will request uh, IARS uh, chairs to comment on the presentation. Well, I think, you know, uh, one is a climate. Uh, is related study and the other is of course a invasive species study. Uh, it would be interesting to see uh, based on the work uh, Dipali and Co doing, uh, the predictive uh, carbon dioxide uh, increase due to expected climate change related actions in the Himalayan region. You know, it, it's a predictive, everybody knows that it's going to happen. Uh, it would be interesting to see what would be the recommendation because this is a natural phenomenon and at the scale which is unthinkable. And what kind of the recommendations will emerge? And uh, based on this recommendation, how can this be mitigated? I think, you know, a possible uh, exploration on that area uh, would probably be good to start at this point of time. You know, what Dr. Satyakuna said, multiple institutions are doing similar studies, and there is a whole range of data set which is coming out. But I think it's probably time for you people to look into what kind of a mitigation strategy that needs to be looked at? You know, 10 years, 20 years is too short a time frame in the, in the climate change scenario. So uh, that we would be probably looking forward to the mitigation strategy that we would be taking. That's, that's something which I suggested. Uh, Siku, I think, you know, it's a bit alarming. Looking at the picture, what you have shown uh, in the different ranges, you know, the 
three or four different species of uh, invasive species. Uh, it appears the future of the under canopy vegetation in the Rajaji Tiger Reserve is going to become largely invaded by the invasive species. You know, in, uh, can you give a uh, time frame in which this will happen? Possible time frame where invasive species will completely take over Arthia. I think, you know, uh, you know, the managers would probably be waiting for that kind of answer. In 10 years' time frame, in 15 years' time frame, in 20 years' time frame, this is what you need to do contain the invasive species. You know, our science experiment is one thing, our research is one thing, but to give suggestions to the managers what could be their action in, in a time gap of 5 years, 10 years, 15 years is the idea. So I think, you know, the predictive recommendation is very useful. Thank you. 
management strategy like as uh, canopy cover we are uh, mentioning so canopy cover uh, plays a major role uh, 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 for the for the distribution of uh, these uh, invasive value species so overall uh, the study uh, emphasizing the importance of site tracking the control of lantana and the restoration of canopy cover in the western rajasthan to mitigate uh, its negative impact on soil nutrient and ecosystem system so it will be very very important to uh, uh, study the nutrient aspect in relation to invasive uh, plants so uh, thank you thank you very much both the presentations are uh, wonderful and uh, once again uh, I, i would like to uh, thank program committee for giving us the opportunity and i would also thank uh, So we'll break for tea and we'll meet here back at 11:30.